Okay, let's let's start. Hi, and uh, thanks for for coming to this meetup. Uh, I'm Lucas Chelstrom. Um, currently, a high school student, uh, university student, uh, formerly high school student too. Uh, and today, I'm gonna talk about my summer project. Um, basically, so I was in the military last year. And uh, well, because it's mandatory. First part of it uh, of the year, I, I did normal military stuff. I did not enjoy a lot. Um, but the second half, I got to program a bit. So, well, what other things can you do than, in, well, implement new virtualization techniques? Um, yeah. So we've ignited this then the pro product of, of that, those ideas I got while being in the military last year. A um, couple of things about me. I've, I've been um, for around f more than four years uh, in the Kubernetes space. Uh, formerly, when we had maintainers, I was that kind of thing. Now it's officially called approver and sub-project owner, uh, as we have so many. It's so big. Um, but basically leading a couple of special interest groups and, and working groups. Also, I've been speaking at six, seven, eight KubeCons, I don't know. Um, and now this summer, basically, I, I had a, this, this idea for to make virtualization fast, basically. So we tend to think of virtualization as something that, well, it ta you, you boot the thing, and then, then you go for a coffee, and 15 minutes later, it might be running or it might not. Um, but taking that into, like, it takes a, one second or a fraction of a second to boot, and boom, there we go. Um, actually making that mainstream and, and bringing that to the container world. Uh, so, well, I have a, like, I'm a university student, but I have this, like, company that I'm running besides uh, for Kubernetes, everything, consulting, architecture review. And for, actually, funny, because I've been working soon three years for WeWorks uh, doing their stuff. I hope you're gonna, um, so I'm, I'm running for two years now, we've been running the Finnish uh, Kubernetes meetups. And um, we also now have like a, this large, this Cloud Native Nordics, so like this large collaboration between all the Kubernetes and Cloud Native meetups uh, in the Nordic countries. So I'm, I'm doing that with another CNCF ambassador. Um, we now have uh, three meetups in Finland. We actually started, like I published the other day, the, the Turku, uh, new Turku Kubernetes meetup. Um, in all, all in all, the, the Cloud Native Nordics has grown fairly big. Uh, we have now had 67 meetup across, meetups across all of the Nordic countries, uh, where more than 4K members and also have uh, around 100 or exactly 100 speakers at the moment. Uh, what does this translate for in Finland then? Well, basically this. Uh, these are the companies that have been sponsoring so far and we, we have more, more coming too. So that is also like, I hope you're gonna uh, come to the Kubernetes and Cloud CNCF meetups too and consider coming, talking uh, about how you use Kubernetes on, and also sponsoring uh, and these are the, the companies that are on both. We are also have a fair amount of meetups coming up uh, in October. So first, in Helsinki, we have uh, three speakers, actually, for the first time, three speakers not from Finland. Uh, Russ Miles, Alexander, and Gregory. And this one is at Nokia. Then uh, three four-hour workshops, hands-on getting started with Kubernetes uh, in Tampere. And lastly, uh, meet up in Turku, the f last of October. So, hope to, to see you all there. But then, to the talk. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing before Ignite, um, which was basically doing cluster lifecycle, cluster deployments in Kubernetes, um, and making that easier, because uh, it was at least four years ago, it, deploying Kubernetes was a mess uh, and it, on your own hardware. Uh, it 
depending on, on how you look at it, it still is. Um, so we, we set out this, these efforts to make it easier and then make people actually successful in, in doing these kinds of things, commoditizing different pieces of software. So with that, I'm going to talk about uh, first Mini, uh, Minikube and KubeADM and then Cluster API, um, and then talk about this virtualization technique with Firecracker, uh, and then Weave Ignite that I've built this summer uh, with my friend on, on Weave's behalf then. Cool. So we, also, we already had a, like, how does Kubernetes work uh, talk. Uh, so that was, that was nice. I, I'll, I'd like to add a couple of those things. Um, so we have a TD single source of truth. The database we have like um, gRPC communication between those. Then the heart of the cluster, at least in my opinion, is the API server, which, yes, is a simple uh, REST API, simple, but it has loads of logic actually making these kinds of things that, uh, that you showed here, like authorization and that kind of stuff work. Because uh, everything is talking to the API server, so nothing else than that component talks to STD, at CD, and the controller manager with all its loops, and the scheduling binding pods to those. Um, and then, like, all these well-defined specs, uh, it's also it was well mentioned that you don't have to use Docker. Anything that implements a container runtime interface actually works. Uh, so container runtime interface is a Kubernetes uh, created spec or interface, uh, and anything that complies to that, for example, container D or CRIO, or like these rocket kata containers, different things. There's like, there's like a lot, uh, but anything uh, anything that that satisfies that uh, actually will will let you run a container, and hopefully you're going to use OCI at the end of the day, which is a specification what, for what a container is. And then we have CNI, which is doing all the networking and and when, when the previous speaker was uh, saying Weave, he meant uh, Weave Net. Uh, Weave has like a bazillion of other projects, um, like Ignite, for example. And pretty much all of them are open source. Also, when saying that uh, Kubernetes deployment is easy, I actually not agree, because uh, <laughs> that's been my job for, the, for three years. Um, so just thinking about the certificates, I, I just before coming up here, posted uh, or copied this from an old talk. I didn't mean to say it. But anyways, we have the API, so we have a, like, just considering the certificates, uh, we have a self, uh, hopefully not self-signed, but an HTTPS certificate for serving the API server requests. Uh, then controller manager and scheduler needs to have client certificates using the same CA to talk to the API server. Cool, so far so good. Uh, then you have your kubelet running your, your first node, maybe running your master. That kubelet needs to have a client certificate to the API server, so the API server can authenticate and authorize that correctly. They need to have specific, these like common names and organizations uh, put in the well, like <laughs> good, good ways. Um, then if you try to join a new node, you need to do a really fun dance and because now when you're joining this new node, you might not know that it actually, well, when, when starting the cluster first, in the first place, you might not know that you're gonna, how many nodes you're gonna have. So if you, if you do that, you need to have some kind of uh, shared secret. Here, for example, a bootstrap token. That bootstrap token goes into the API server. You put a CSR, then you have some controller loops which sign and approve that. And then maybe you have got a new, cube conf uh, a new client cert for the kubelet. <coughs> um, and then still, your cluster is insecure because you, you forgot that the API server, when typing kubectl logs, your API server actually talks to the kubelet. So you need to have a self-signed HTTP, uh, well, it's by default self-signed, but you need to have of the same CA a serving cert for the kubelet so that when, when it serves its, its logs and exec endpoints, it can actually verify that the API server is what it ought to be, uh, and the other way around. And like, this is just for a couple of the components, because when the kubelet is normally talking, <coughs> so like, it's this fun dance. The API server, when kubectl logs, first you talk to the API server, the API server talks to the kubelet, the kubelet need to verify that 
the API servers that actually that, and then it uses the client certificate to talk to the API server to ask is the API server the API server that it actually should be, and then like all the other way around. So you actually need to have like my point here is like you need to have at least 10, 15 different certificates and three different CAs to actually make the basic functionality works, if you want to be secure at least. Um, so, and also another thing, um, these are the flags of just the control plane components. So like, we have <laughs> some feature gates. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then that was the first category of the API server. Then we have the second, third. And like, you know, it goes on like this. And the kubelet has the most of them, like 200 plus. Uh, I didn't even include that here. But like, these are just the control plane components. And I could go on fairly, for a fairly long time. So that's why, like, and, and yeah, what, what can we do about this? And, because um, everybody needs to run their cluster uh, somehow. Also, the providers. I mean, we have 100 different certified providers for Kubernetes. Uh, and all they, the Kubernetes is around 15,000 code, lines of code uh, in Go. Uh, probably more at this point. Uh, so if every provider, we have 100 providers, need to implement exactly the same code, they're going to be bugs, they're going to be misconfigurations. And also, there's the problem of Kubernetes having legacy defaults when it was assumed that all the cluster is, is like trusted. Uh, oh, sorry, all the communication between the components are trusted. Um, that was the case with Kubernetes 1.3 and 1.4 and that kind of stuff. We didn't have any authentication or authorization or nothing uh, that actually did something. So, yeah. We, so in, in like the summer of 2016, two, when Kubernetes was two, turned two years, uh, myself and a couple of other people started C Cluster Lifecycle, uh, which I'm a co-lead for. So it, our, our mission statement is basically make Kubernetes deployment sane, like of, make the installation process, the upgrading process, the configuration process, like. AJ, everything around that, um, a bit more sane and manageable for those whose main job it is not to operate Kubernetes, uh, but they still need it. So we created KubeADM, and uh, it took us two and a half years to get that from like first prototype to product, uh, GA. So we actually, with Kubernetes uh, strict guidelines of stability, could say that it's GA, and then we it was a couple of people, including myself, uh, main job. Uh, so that just like tells something about the complexity. Um, but why do we have it? Um, first, um, you have some kind of infrastructure, be it Raspberry Pis. Um, that is a pet project of mine. To, so like three years, four years ago, I, I made, ported Kubernetes to Raspberry Pi. So like. You can have Raspberry Pi as your infrastructure, as long as you get some machines, or GCP, or Azure, or whatever. Uh, but once you have the machines, you need to install Kubernetes on top. What do you do? You use kubedm in all of them. So like kubedm init from the first thing, then kubedm join, as many masters as you want, and as many nodes as you want. And just like to also show that it's, it's actually possible, uh, there we go. We generate certificates, uh, <laughs> more certificates in cube config files than all the flags and stuff there. Um, we're actually running the, the API server, the co master components, uh, in a babysit by the, the kubelet. So we're running them in containers. Uh, then configuration, making the stuff at least semi-secure and like some add-ons. And this gives us a nearly functional cluster because now we don't have any networking yet. So what I would do in this case would be to like kubectl apply HTTPS weave cube. 
So for example, with this, I've now installed, uh, well, need to tell where the cube config is too. So with that, running on my phone's Wi-Fi, um, <laughs> I've, I've installed uh, WeaveNet as a Kubernetes manifest. So, so yeah, that, that's like how you now, uh, actually without uh, writing a lot of systemd stuff and like uh, generating all the, the stuff yourself with, with OpenSSL or something, can get running with Kubernetes pretty smoothly. Um, yeah, maybe. Well, I could just show that now it's like we have get nodes, one node, my machine, master, it's ready. It's running the latest Kubernetes. And also when dealing with Kubernetes upgrades, you have a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work because defaults always change, often in the better direction, but then if they do change into the better direction, they're 90% of the cases they're disruptive when upgrading, <laughs> so, so that's a problem. But you want, if you do Kubernetes Minute and join, because it spit out this token for you to join, then you have Kubernetes API to, to have your stuff on. We call, that is the, the distinct scope of Kubernetes is, is to do that and only that, because like, considering all of this, there's like a million of, of possibilities uh, to actually, uh, like the matrix is, is just too huge. And just considering the middle layer, if we have like around 800 flags for just the, the mainstream, like the, the core components. Um, but then you also have like a lot of add-ons and you, you need something to actually manage your infrastructure. Uh, so, so how do you do that? And like, so yeah, there we have like kubedm is the, the thing in the middle. And this can actually be used, reused by all of the 100 different certified providers, and, and a fair amount of them do, which is, which is great. Because then, like, when upgrading, we can make sure that the, the good defaults, the same defaults, uh, which are secure, are put into Kubernetes first, and then gradually rolled out as the defaults in the Kubernetes components, for example. Um, and then, but then it, it differs quite a lot from, from stuff that makes it end-to-end, -end, like COPS, Kubes or something, you say COPS creates cluster and it goes ahead and does it in EC2. Um, so yeah, um, but, but we also have another thing we call cluster API, which is using uh, custom resource definitions to then manage the infrastructure uh, in, a, in a unified way, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit. But first, uh, let's head over to virtualization, which has something to do with what I just talked about. But so Weave Ignite, um, the one liner is like open source, yes. Uh, I, pretty much everything that I, I do uh, or have done so far is, has been open source and I really enjoy that. Um, virtual machine, yes, it's a real virtual machine. Manager with a container UX, yes, we all love Docker's UX, so we <laughs> just copied it, right? Uh, <laughs> And then uh, I'm building GitOps management to add some production uh, readiness into it. Um, so yeah, we have then like taken Firecracker, an Amazon project, um, and uh, combined that with OCI, the spec we, we all love from that is doing all our containers. Uh, and, and like marrying these actually gives us a really nice blend between uh, containers and VMs. We can like now actually run VMs, but we think they're containers. Like they, they look like containers. And then if we wanna go into production with this, we can manage a set of VMs declaratively, um, you know, like with, with GitOps, like, like both of the previous uh, speakers talked about, like you push something to Git, then it either like rolls out through using Ansible or whatever system, or you have your policies and that kind of stuff as code. Okay, um, well, it, it, as I said, like, I was programming in the military. Uh, we had, <laughs> how to say it in the most uh, diplomatic way, we had a lot of requirements, but maybe not so much money. Uh, 
to, to actually make that happen. And uh, that means, for example, that we, didn't, we were, weren't like just given like a lot of virtualization techniques or licenses or whatever. We had some Windows stuff and we had some like force turn some PCs into to Linux. Um, and, and that was what we worked with. Um, but we still had to manage lar large networks and um, make uh, solve different things uh, where, we, where we tried to use containers, but it just didn't work. Because the application that we ran was really special and it needed certain kernel parameters and like stuff. And then, then it blew up all the network interfaces on the, <laughs> on the host if, if like anything could go wrong and it like had all weird things. Uh, needed layer two network connectivity to send weird packets and that kind of stuff. And it was like, it was, I, I think that kind of usage can be pretty normal in, in other cases too. Maybe ex not exactly that, and, and, but anyways, um, it's, it, the main point is that you need virtualization in, in different, at different times. Um, and it's just two ways of, of, of doing it and two layers. Like you often have virtualization underneath and then you run your containers on top. The main point of Cloud Native is you don't use your VMs to, to run your apps, but you use uh, containers to run your apps and then the VMs to run the set of containers. Um, so so then, then we needed to go to open source, so we, we just checked because we had no money for that thing. We just checked what, what is out there. Uh, and we saw like, oh, a month ago, Amazon released this at a three invent. Uh, it's like, <laughs> it's like alpha, but like, let's try. Um, so so we, we started using Firecracker, uh, but it was very low level. And for myself, I never, like, I'm not a KVM developer. Most of us aren't. Uh, so it took us like two weeks to actually figure out what is what is what, because uh, it was yeah it was really hard. But what what did we end up with? Yeah, 500 line of bash script. Uh, so so that was maybe not no, the no, most optimal user experience. It, um, and uh, well, we needed this application um, with its special requirements, but we also ran a lot of containers. So we needed it somehow to to integrate between those these two worlds. So, yeah, um, that is like that is like the backstory, and um, we we were successful with it, and we actually were impressed that just a month after its its announcement, actually was something we could use in production, and and we did since like January sometime um, after we had figured it out. So for those who don't happen to be KVM devs, it's rather complex. To, to work with. Um, so basically, I, I don't know if, if this is obvious or not, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. Like, you have some bare metal host, and then your container is not a virtual machine because your container is just using uh, C groups and uh, namespaces, capabilities in the Linux kernel to isolate your stuff up here, your applications, uh, from, from each other. But as they share the same kernel, that obviously means that if you can exploit the kernel in some way to, to break out, then, well, you see a lot of other fun stuff, uh, your neighbor containers. So what can we do about that and what does virtualization help with that is that you have your OS or like your, your VM and then you have actually a one kernel per that you're running <coughs> per virtual machine. Which means that now these two neighboring uh, VMs don't share the same kernel. So now you have to use, I don't know, what is it called, Rowhammer or some, some kind of really, really low level way, like on a bytecode level. First exploit the kernel and then exploit the RAM or the CPU or some, somehow to actually, to actually break out. Which is way harder. Um, so it's like one extra layer of security too. So what happens here is like we run one Firecracker process on the bare metal host, each Firecracker per VM, and then each Firecracker process executes a Linux kernel, and then that kernel executes the, the OS. And Firecracker itself has a set of different things, but the, the main point is that it's super minimal. Like 
if you would take Kimu, uh, the other open source project which is doing this, you wouldn't end up with six boxes, but like 136 maybe, because uh, it like emulates floppy drives and like <laughs> does, does all the drivers that have existed uh, at all times basically, which is a good thing, but it just adds extra latency and, and like um, uh, cost, overhead cost when running your VMs. So it's great for compa uh, compatibility, but for this we need a speed. So yeah, we, we said that um, some extra security, Firecracker is super fast. In uh, 125 milliseconds, it can boot, execute a Linux kernel, uh, and then like some, some milliseconds more to, to boot your systemd, uh, and, and there you go. Then the overhead is like five megabytes, per VM, which is, which is really small. Uh, normally, you don't think about even how much the, uh, the VMware process, for example, how much overhead that has, because I don't know if they tell you. Uh, but, but here is like only five megabytes. Um, and also, you can actually run 4,000 VMs on the same physical host. So like you, it's, it's like next level uh, scale for this too. And why, does, why did Amazon do this? Well, they had a new Lambda uh, service, and uh, Lambda and Fargate, yeah. So for serverless workloads, they couldn't just let, let people run containers on their physical hosts uh, just like that. So, so they needed to invent this. But it's hard to use for every, every mortal person, and uh, that's why we, we made this Ignite. Uh, so it's basically like Think Docker. But when you actually do Docker run, it would actually give you a VM. Using the same thing, like using Docker run Ubuntu. And then that gives you an Ubuntu VM, not an Ubuntu container. Uh, that is basically the main idea. Then adding next level speed to that compared to like normal VMs. And um, doing declarative, like all these cloud native patterns that we, that we want to be compliant with. So, Here's a demo. Uh, hopefully it works also on my phone's Wi-Fi. I think it will. But um, first, Ignite run, same as Docker run. Then a Docker image. This is, this is up on Docker Hub. It's really close to stock Ubuntu uh, 18.04 from Docker Hub. Um, but it just like, basically the difference between that image and, and stock Ubuntu from Docker Hub is like, in this we have uh, run apt get install systemd. Because if we're going to run a VM, we need some init system. So, so that is the difference. Then we say two CPUs, one gig of, of, many, uh, of memory, and then dash dash SSH uh, automatically, as a convenience, automatically generates a SSH key pair for us to use. Uh, then PS, images, kernels, logs, exec, SSH, all those like normal. Normal commands you expect from Docker. Um, so there we go. Well, now I'm still running. No, I did do a reset. Cool. Um, so ignite. Let's see these these commands um, that you recognize. Now, I basically, what I do is ignite run. Uh, now I'm going to do dash i, which means interactive, so we can see it booting. Uh, ignite Ubuntu, SSH, CPUs, 2, memory, doing this for demo purposes, and then uh, my VM, for example. So now execute that. And it's creating my VM. It's setting up networking by CNI, and now it's already booted. It went went so fast that like <laughs> it didn't even scroll. Um, and here we are. Uh, I have a different kernel than on host. You can see that. If I here, I have a 500 kernel. I just recently upgraded that. And here in my VM that I'm now attached to running Ubuntu 18.04, which is not the Ubuntu I'm having here. Um, yeah, 
there we have it. Like we can see that um, if I do uh, cat proc CPU info, we can see that I have two processors. Uh, I said I would get uh, one gig of RAM. I got one gig of RAM. Uh, what else? Yeah, actually, what, what's interesting about this is that we, we integrate with the container networking. So like, it's, it's the same CNI as, as WeaveNet, for example. Uh, you can use WeaveNet with this. Like, are you running Kubernetes on a node already? Perfect. You don't need to do anything more. Your, all your VMs are going to get up, hooked up as a normal pod. Um, and this is using like a default, default bridge. Um, and automatically handled uh, for you. Uh, and then, yeah, like whatever you do in a VM, you can continue. Um, but then if I do like that, and I can now do Ignite PS, which looks weird in that, in that size, but what? So like ID, normal, like we can see that we have one OCI image here. Uh, from Docker Hub, which is the Ignite Ubuntu. Then we have another OCI image, uh, which is now cut in half. Uh, WeWorks Ignite Kernel 14, uh, 419, which is another OCI image containing just the kernel binaries and modules. So like we also have uh, distinguished that so you can uh, mix and match between all your kernels and all your uh, root file systems. Um, then for, we are allocated by default four gigs of, of disk space. Uh, one gig of RAM, like just created. Uh, one other nice thing is that if I do in Ignite Inspect VM, uh, my VM, I called it. Well, let's do YAML. Um, is there anything, anyone that sees something uh, that is, I mean, this is different from Docker, but why is it different? What does this like look like? I don't know if it's clear enough to see, but if you have used Kubernetes, you might be, you might see API version, kind, metadata, spec, status. I, when, when, when thinking about like, okay, now I need to have some, some kind of data model for Ignite, what should I use? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, so I just used Kubernetes API Machiner. Um, I don't know if you actually know that. Yes, you can do CRDs, uh, which is like hosted, like which are stored in Kubernetes API server, uh, your custom stuff. But you can also just use the, the API Machiner as such. So this has this exact thing has nothing to do with Kubernetes at the moment. We're planning Kubernetes integrations for it. But it has nothing, it's not stored in Kubernetes, it's, not, it's just a plain JSON file. Uh, but we're using the same uh, semantics to be consistent with the rest of the, the cloud native landscape. And hence it's very, or it's easier to understand uh, for this. So like, and it's, it's good, uh, good patterns too, to like version your stuff, automatic upgrades, like have metadata in a certain place, spec status. So here, like, for example, we declared the spec here from the command line arguments, and then we got something out that, like, well, I'm running with that IP address and, like, that start time and blah, blah, blah. So that is interesting. Then we have, like, in Ignite images, as you'd expect, uh, Ignite kernels, um, ignite logs, if we wanted to see the, uh, my VM. So there we have all of the thing we, let's see how, how the first ignite stuff, or firecracker actually, and then we, we're booting the kernel here. Uh, let's see how, how long it took. I'm running Slack and that kind of stuff. So it took a, it, it took a second, like fair enough. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like I have around 30 tabs on Chrome, so uh, probably that. I said eight fraction of a second, but if, yeah, 
Uh, then booting systemd, uh, I don't know exactly how long that takes, but not, not that long. Uh, so, um, so that is like how it works. I could SSH in, now as I did the SSH key pair, I can SSH into it like again, and do all that kind of like normal stuff you'd expect. And uh, what's funny about this is that I'm gonna let you in a secret here. If we do C list there, any one of you know container D, the middle part of Docker. So when you talk to Docker, it's actually executed in, in container D, a lo like more low level container daemon, and then it's using run C, which implements the OCI specification. Uh, and here we have, we've, we've gone directly on container D, or like we actually started with Docker, but now ported everything to container D. So we're actually, we needed some way. Uh, let, me, let me go to, back to my slides. To tell about this. Uh, so yeah, you have Docker-like UX as we saw. I'm gonna, if I have time, I'm going to show how to do this in a GitOps mode. Uh, but with the architecture, we, we basically have pre-built Ubuntu CentOS, whatever images that Docker provides. Uh, I don't want to get into the business of distributing images for a particular thing. So if there exists something, I'm going to use it. Then what we needed to do uh, is to build some kernels. Uh, this requirement is, is even going away in the next version of Firecracker, uh, which, is, which is fun to see. Uh, but the m primary reason we're building our kernels is that we don't need like a bazillion of keyboard support, for example, <laughs> like in the stock Ubuntu kernel or like different devices. Um, so, so this is a bit more minimal, but it's, it's still using OCI as the uh, way of content distribution. And then I like to see that in dif different other places too, where uh, you could talk about using OCI or abusing, I don't know. Uh, but, but like it's a, it's a fancy tar file. So, so using that tar file with signing and like uh, all these things we figured out for us already, uh, I don't need to implement a new scheme for getting like my file from there to here. Um, and um, and that also has like other very very good uh, side effects. Then, so what we do basically is we take these two, uh, we smash them in or on top of each other with device mapper. Uh, so so like a layered approach there with device mapper. Uh, with that, we give it then to Firecracker. Firecracker takes two inputs: the device with the like the, the block device uh, with the root file system and a kernel to execute. So those are the two inputs for, for Firecracker. But then a funny thing, people say that VMs are more secure than containers, right? That, that's a thing you've heard. But what you might not have heard is that if we do this, that they actually show here, we'd directly execute the Firecracker process on host, then we'd, we're even more vulnerable to side channel that like some whatever, like different exploiting the CPU if we don't isolate and constrain the Firecracker process itself. So, so that's like a fun one. Like, <laughs> I, I can't explain exactly why it's like that. Uh, but, and I haven't tried breaking out of, of that kind of scenario. But um, it, I've seen reasonable proof of, of that being true. So <laughs> what do we do? We have this pro, we have this untrusted process that is Firecracker that we're running our host, how can we isolate it? Well, it turns out that containers are pretty good at isolating things too, right? <laughs> so, so we put the, the VM executor inside of a container. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Amy, yes, it is ironical. <laughs> so what we do here as PID1, uh, we have ignite spawn, which is basically the thing that reads our JSON file and executes Firecracker. Uh, it also is a thing that, that like takes, for example, if we'd use Docker as the container runtime here, Docker has automatically set up an IP address for us. So what ignite spawn then does is like, it removes the IP from there and starts a local DHCP server so that when Firecracker starts a VM, the Linux kernel executes, the Linux kernel is actually gonna ask do I have an IP? Because like, 
I mean, not that, that's a big problem of, of like uh, when running a new virtual machine. With, with containers, we, we actually have that like, possibility to actually ex directly execute stuff in our, like work around, if we're root on the host, we can actually work around these namespaces and find our way into the container. But we can't do that in the same way uh, for a uh, virtual machine. So after the, fact, after the fact we've started a virtual machine, we, unless we have SSH or something like that, it's very hard to actually get in there because that's part of the security model, right? Um, so, so here the kernel actually does DHCP request because we started with a kernel parameter IP equals DHCP. And here it gets back from the container, from CNI. We, we've written our small DHCP server to do this. And then the kernel configures the at zero for us automatically. So, so like, everything's fine. Um, so yeah, that is, that is like how it works. And now we're using, reusing OCI again, because we needed some, some place to run a long, uh, long running process. We needed some place to put it. We used systemd at first, but that kind of sucked, uh, actually, uh, for this thing at least. But then also isolating, we get that for free. So here we're using containerd uh, to actually to actually isolate it. Um, so building VM images the, the new way. Uh, normally you think of like, well I grab the Ubuntu ISO file or like I don't know AMI file from somewhere or like VMDK file and, and then uh, after it's downloaded a couple of 10 gigs, then <laughs> then I, I started in Packer and like boot up the, the BIOS and like all the, the things and like have some way to automate the Ubuntu install process. But here, I actually like do from Ubuntu, then apt get update, apt get install, the tools I want. Then <laughs> if, if I want to do something more, then I'll just add it there. Uh, and boom, I have, my, I have my image, it's like around 200 megabytes, uh, not 200 gigabytes. And then the kernel, the same way, it just download the, the or just, an, this is not a straightforward, so straightforward, like compiling your kernel, but it's, it's very possible. And then just from scratch, using a multi-stage build, add in the, the kernel, add in the modules that I want, and boom. And I said, like, with, uh, with the next version of Firecracker, you can boot a stock Ubuntu kernel too, if you were like that. So, I mean, it's, it's nice to do Ignite Run and like Ignite Delete and like Ignite or re Remove and, and those kinds of things. But like, then when like, if you, if you imagine that you want to do this a couple of hundred times, it's maybe not that great. Um, so I said, yes, I'm working for, or contracting for WeWorks as part of my Luxus Labs company, and um, I've been doing that for three years. So, so obviously we, we built in GitOps into this because um, that's kind of Weave's mantra. Um, so we start by storing the intent, like the, the desired state in Git, and now it comes, com comes also back to why it's so great to have this, um, this spec. Like, why is it so great to have first some descriptors of what is this, then metadata, how can I identify this, then what do I want, and then what did I get? Uh, so, so that means you check in this part into Git. What do I want? Yes, a VM, I want two CPUs, disk size blah, memory this. I want to have these kinds of, and I could even pin the shasm of, of the, the OCI images I, I want here. And then, when you when you check that into Git, you have uh, something that reconciles. I mean, this could be the, the Kubernetes controller manager, but it could also be Ignite D that we have, like which basically connects a Git repo, pulls the stuff as it uh, progresses, and then if it finds a VM that it should run, then it runs it. And when it runs it, it has now populated the status portion of this API structure. Then it does a git commit, git push, and boom. Now in our git repo, we can actually know what our IP addresses are and like all that kind of stuff. And we can then also observe the difference between what we ought to run and what we're actually running. 
So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, as part of this, I, I and my friend, uh, the friend is also living here nearby, uh, Tick Kurel, I think, uh, and he also was in the military doing these things with me. So I, I hired him to WeWorks. Uh, <laughs> this is a summer internship. We're both studying at Alta now. Um, and uh, so we, as part of this, we, uh, we discovered that this GitOps stuff that we built was pretty generic. So we, we pulled it out of Ignite and made a dedicated GitOps toolkit. So if you'd li like to create your own kind of that kind of thing, Cycle, you have some really pre-made nice tools here. Uh, it's, it's a bit, like it's, we have, <laughs> uh, this was one of the last things I did before uh, starting university. So, so I didn't actually have time to write some documentation. So, <laughs> uh, other than like um, the basics, but the the essential thing is that it it can do these kinds of loops and and uh, it then reuses all of the Kubernetes API machinery to to do these like spec metadata status and then you can act on that. Why did I even in the first place talk about Kubernetes? Well. The primary reason, so I mean, I got this idea while being in the military. In the military, we, we ended up with the 500 line bash script, and we, we <laughs> they're sticking to that. I, I heard now, like, also more than half a year after, uh, they, they didn't even want to poke the system. They, it just continued running, so <laughs> they were like, hands off, don't touch it. Um, um, so, yeah, but well, Ignite is now, <laughs> now a better way of, of, of doing it. Uh, and I got this idea, and then I thought, like, how can I actually apply this uh, Firecracker user experience uh, in practice? So what, what business use cases are there? So I, like, uh, talked to, talk to WeWorks, uh, different things, uh, also other customers and, like, potential uh, users. And uh, one of the primary reasons were testing. It was, uh, well, legacy, oops legacy applications, uh, like the, the use case we had, but primarily running Kubernetes. Like, if you have to run Kubernetes now, either you, you like, as previously mentioned, you use Amazon to create temporary, like, loads of machines, uh, and then use that to actually do your testing for all of your Kubernetes stuff and all that kind of things, but what if you, you just could spin up 4,000 VMs on your, your laptop, uh, then, then that actually could work. So, so what we did here is some, what I actually have some, some screencasts of is like running a couple of, of VMs and then installing Kubernetes on top of these. And they, they work, function just as normal. We can test different configurations, settings, uh, experiment it, break it, uh, simulate uh, network partitions and whatever uh, between these and uh, a, lo a lot of other stuff. Um, so, kind is like Kubernetes in Docker, uh, where there's some, some progress in, in making, making this uh, kind also work with Ignite, so that you can choose to do it in Docker, or, yeah, the, the final thing. Or the cluster API thing. So, the cluster API is basically a, declarative specification of the inf infrastructure you want. So you, you like start a Kubernetes cluster with one just simple simple stuff, and then we have this unified API that is like consistent across all of these, I, I talked about all of these hundreds of, of different distributions. Uh, now if we have a generic specification of what you want, and then just a small part that is provider specific, like if I'm on WeSphere or whatever, Amazon, then if this part is like the only thing you need to learn and all the other things are the same, the reconciliation loops and that kind of stuff. Um, that, is, that is a part of cluster API. And yes, that's why we built Ignite, to have some, you feed it the cluster API, I want these machines, then boom, 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 we have three VMs installed Kubernetes, and there we go. So there you have all that kind of stuff on bare metal. So yeah, um, if you wanna check out Ignite, it's on GitHub, github.com, slash WeWork slash Ignite, ignite.readadocs.org if you are looking for documentation. And finally, uh, it also works on Raspberry Pi. 
So uh, soon, when my PR is merged, this was my last weekend project. Uh, <laughs> I actually uh, reached out to the Firecracker team because we, we tried it. It was something missing uh, for a generic interrupt controller, something I didn't know existed before. Uh, but it supported like a version 3 and we just need a version 2. Now that's, that's pretty much there. So if you have Raspberry Pi 4, you should in a couple of weeks be able to run uh, VMs on your Raspberry Pi uh, just, just like that. And it took half a second to boot. So that was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, could be used as a learning tool and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's questions. Uh, I don't know if I have time, but... Perfect, yes. Thank you. <laughs>